On wintry nights, Raphael would lay at Judge Miller's feet before the roaring library fire. During the four years since his birth, he had lived a life of ease on the Miller farm in the Santa Clara Valley, where he was indulged and lavished with attention. By the fall of 1897, he had developed a fine animal pride in himself, to which was added the dignity that comes with affection and respect. Never having wandered far from the Miller farm, there was no way he could have imagined another way of life beyond his comfortable civilized existence. instincts wouldn't allow him to become a mere pampered house dog. He was neither house dog nor kennel dog, but was given the full run of the farm. The whole realm was his, and he loved plunging into the swimming hole or rambling with the Miller children, who treated him with inseparable devotion. Sensing his special favor and the dignity of his breed, the other domestic animals were quick to recognize that the realm was his. In the animal kingdom of Judge Miller's farm, Raphael was the animal king. You get in the best, always have and always will. You eat just like the folks around here, huh? Ah, come here, baby. But what's wrong with that, huh? What's wrong with that? Rafe. You a gentleman. Come, Rafael. Let's have a nice walk. Those days, I lost big in the lottery. I have five children. You know that, don't you? Sure, you know it. You got a big, smart head. You're the smartest dog I ever seen in my life. Well, a man's got to live. Just. Just like a dog got to live. It's not easy. Look. If this dog cannot pull, no dog can. He weighs 140 pounds. And he's as smart as a man. Sure, he's smarter than some of them. You know, he always knows what you're thinking. Well, maybe he does sometimes, but he don't now. You say fifty dollars. Here it is. I tell you, I can use every big dog I can get up there. Up there, they really need them. Dogs wear out so fast up there that we don't have time to sell them our life. Gold, amigo. Gold. They done struck it. Let's get them on. You, you twist this, and you can choke him plenty. Just be careful. You could choke him to death. Well, you can lay all your damn flower money that that ain't gonna happen. Come on, boy. <laughs> 
sure does weigh 140 pounds. Judge Miller, he's going to fire me for this. He knows Rafael ain't going to run away just like that. He has everything he wants right here. He had everything. Rafael. Having known nothing but human kindness and affection, Raphael had learned to trust man, and his betrayal was beyond his understanding. He had never experienced human cruelty before, and a sleeping anger in him was awakened. He longed for the moment he would return to the comfort and security of Judge Miller's fireside. How much will you pay for him then? Oh, I think he's worth about $150. You might make a man millions of dollars. Oh, that's good. That thing can't get out of there, Kenny. Looks to me like you got yourself a mad dog on your hands. No, not no more. You got one on your hands. <laughs> but don't worry. I got him shut in there real tight for you. Moved about from wagon to train to cart, Rayfield's powerful sense of direction had become confused. And should he be let free by his strange captors, there was a growing panic that he would be unable to find his way back to Judge Miller's farm and familiar things and human kindness. Because men groping in the Arctic darkness had discovered the glimmer of gold, and because steamship and transportation companies were exploiting the find, thousands of men were rushing into the northern wild, leaving the comforts and codes of civilization behind them. These men needed dogs, and the dogs they wanted were heavy dogs with strong muscles by which to toil, and furry coats to protect them from the frost. At last one morning, the propeller was quiet and the ship was pervaded with an atmosphere of excitement. Raphael felt, as did the other now nameless dogs, that a change was at hand. At the same time, he was oppressed by a sense of impending calamity.
His ill treatment and captivity had flung the dog into a rage. His eyes had turned bloodshot, and he had all the appearance of a mad and raging beast. He had never attacked a man before, never having had cause to consider him an enemy. But his torment inflamed his wrath to a fever pitch, which would be unleashed upon the first tormentor who gave him the opportunity of attack. He looks like he's got the hydrophobia. You see all that white stuff on his jaws? you want. If I was you, I'd give up now. Save myself some trouble. I believe you done got too rough on him, Digger. I believe you killed this one. No, I never killed but one dog in my life. That's when I was just starting out. He was almost as big as this red-eyed devil, but he didn't have the guts this one's got. <laughs> Take old red eyes here. He's learned something. He ain't never gonna forget that. I guarantee them tea you ain't. <laughs> <laughs> He had learned once and for all that he stood no chance against a man with a club. It was a lesson he was never to forget. A man with a club was a lawgiver, a master to be obeyed if he was to survive. Sacred up. That's one dog, huh? That's one, two dogs. How much? Three hundred dollars, Francois. I'm making you a present of that. Uh. I don't sell him to you just for the money. I want you to come back down here and buy more dogs. And you ain't gonna do it if the powder snow is blowing over your bones up there in some godforsaken territory. Where you headed this time, Frenchie? Matter where it is. I know you ain't gonna beat me there. You like to beat these dogs too much. Well, you can tell me. I ain't gonna tell nobody. To Kevin. I'm going to Kevin. Northeast? Good God, man. There ain't nothing up there but freezing to death. You gonna leave your bones in the ice. There's a plenty of them there already. Are you the one that bought this dog? When I bought him, I didn't buy him. He's the last dog I need for the best deal I put together. But you know, I've only got but $200. And Digger, he won three. 
Where have you come from? California. Been up here a couple days looking for a big dog. Then where you go? Place called Bella Coola. If I can find anybody that knows the way. How are you gonna get there? You got no sled, no team? Only got a cheap coat and a funny hat. I'm gonna walk. Besides the dog, you left out two things I'm gonna take with me. A rifle and a sack of salt. I can live anywhere there's game. This ain't California, mon ami. <laughs> no, but it's the woods. I've never had any trouble in the woods. You know, I believe you when you say. Now if you get one hundred dollars too, we buy the dog. It's all I need. Then you and me get on the trail. Well, it may be all you need to get your team together, but I've got to get to Bellacula. I tell you, I'm going up that way. I know all about Bellacula. You're throwing with me, and I get you there. I might as well break into California as one. Well. Him and you. Eh? <laughs> Okay. I'll go get my gear. And you get the dog. Back to my big dog. Well, you don't mean to tell me you talked that guy into heading for two cabin with you. You don't know it yet, but that's what I've done. Well, I hope he ain't going to mind when he does know it. Maybe he'll put you in the traces. He's not going to mind. When he gets out there with Francois, he's going to want to stay close. <laughs> And so the dog set out with his new masters to an unknown destination, not knowing to what purpose he would be put. All his days he had never run from a fight, but he was beginning to learn the code of the uncivilized world where survival was paramount, and things were done not because they were right, but because it was easier to do them and survive than not to do them. As their climb progressed, the temperature fell, and the crisp, cold air began to catch in his lungs. He longed for the warmth he had enjoyed in the sunny land of the Miller farm. Soon he was walking in a white, cold mush like mud. It had very little scent and a bite like fire before quickly dissolving in his mouth. It was his first experience of snow. Takes 10 weeks. The weather is good. The weather is no good. Takes longer. But we got a good team. A good lit dog. That spitz is the best. We make it. And we get the gold. All the gold in the world. Gonna be rich. Gonna live in uh, Vancouver, Montreal, anywhere we like. Anywhere. We go all the way to Paris. Bellacula. Let's just get there. Bellacula is enough for me. Look. Come on. We go up past this canyon, and then up past Sheep Camp, and then the then the Chilkoot, and then through the scales, and then we make Job's Glacier, and we're lucky we make Job's Glacier in one week. And then we go up past Lake Bennett, uh, all over to Lake Leberge, where they found Big Michael Claire's body last year. And then we go up by Pierre Noir Volcano. We get by Pierre Noir, we'll be in Bellacula in six weeks. Well, that sounds about right to me. I'm going to be meeting two pretty good boys up there. I just hope they got a map this size to get them there. <laughs> Stay away from Spitz. Where are we going? You're gonna be eating both them dogs. Hey, stay! Come on! Come on! Come 
Vance, while fastened upon him an arrangement of harness and traces such as he had seen grooms put on horses, the dog's dignity was deeply hurt in being made a beast of burden, but he was too wise to rebel. Francois was stern, demanding instant obedience, and by virtue of his whip, receiving it. him quick as anything. This one, it looks like he can pull the devil up by the roots. Although the toil of the harness was at first confusing and difficult, the new California dog settled into it and did his best. He had been placed between two experienced dogs so that he might learn by their example. He was surprised at the eagerness which animated the whole team under the leadership of Spitz, the lead dog who was fiercely irritable at whatever delay or confusion retarded their progress on the trail. Hey! Hey, you must never eat the snow. It drives you mad. You must melt it down. Then it's the greatest water in the world, even more pure than rain. Hey! Oh, David! Ah, you're getting old. My old Davy, come on. Give me your leg. You've been with me a long time, huh? All over the Klondike. Mon bon vieux Davy. <laughs> hey, big boy. This is no like California, hey? We get better cola, and me and Southern, we buy you a gold color. <laughs> you get better cola? Get back to Dawson. Hey. Mush on! Mush! His hey. feet were not so compact and hard as the feet of the huskies. His had softened during the many generations since his last ancestor was tamed to civilization. But in time, his feet grew hard to the trail, and he found he had the capacity to adapt himself to his new existence. Gold fever isn't just a name. Where I come from in California, a lot of men die on a gold fever right now. Just right now, tonight. They're all the same, those guys. Always talking, but they ain't never getting rich. Yeah. yeah a couple of friends spent a lot of time scratching around the Sierra Madres. We hit it a couple of times, but it was always on a tail end of somebody else's strike. Yeah. I've heard they've cleaned those hills out pretty good. Yeah, we met up with a fellow who'd been here. He was with the first bunch when they made the strike at Bonanza Creek. But all he could talk about was a place called Bella Coola. The way he talked about it, I couldn't not believe him. He said it was awful damn hard to get here and it wasn't even on the map. But he didn't make it, so I figured I'd try. At least I won't be getting somebody else's leavings. This one between Spitz and Salt Lake. He learns faster there. But he better leave Spitz alone. That Spit, it had the thousand duck fights. He's still here with us. All the others are dead. They are dead in the great land. 
dead in the barrens. And that big California dog is going to be dead in the Yukon, if you don't watch out. Uh, this big one's going to take a lot of killing, Francois. He must go 130, 140 pounds. He's not just going to lie down and get chopped up. His ability to adapt to his toil was swift, and it wasn't long before he was moved closer to the lead. Not only did he learn by experience, but instincts long dead came to life again. The domesticated generations of his breed seemed to fall from him. His muscles became hard as iron, and he grew callous to ordinary pain. As time passed and the remembrance of days of warmth and affection receded in memory, he gave up hope of ever hearing his name Raphael called out to him again. He had become known simply as the California Dog. For you. I will. Just keep moving. Move. Let's take it. Fire. I will die for that fire. Got 
shot. The dogs. Hey? They're gonna make it. We're all gonna make it. Here. Pull it up in your head. Glacier grown. The woman, she have a baby. The glacier, she have the ice. They both sound the same. Hey, California. What's wrong with you? You got a long way to go tomorrow, eh? Forty miles we've got to make. Damn lake must have froze your brains. I fished you out and all you want to do is push the dogs and you and me to death. You don't have to make 40 miles in one day. Nobody up here does that. Nobody up here is gonna make the strike we're gonna make. If it's at Bella Coola, it's been there for thousands of years. Thousands of years. It'll keep. But you keep pushing the way you do and the dogs won't keep and neither will we. Hey, you just wait a couple of weeks and we take you to bed with us. And the bed, she will be gold. Gold post, gold sheets, gold everything. <laughs> he loves the fire. He needs to get warm, like me. The howl of the wolf was as the cry of his ancestors. And in a mysterious way, he would remember back to the time when wild dogs ranged in packs through the primeval forest. The old ways of his breed survival came to him without effort or discovery, as though they had been his always. <laughs> There was a certain pride that gripped the dogs at break of camp, transforming them from sullen brutes into straining, eager, ambitious creatures. A pride that held the dogs to their toil to the last gasp and broke their hearts if they failed or were cut out of the harness. This was the pride which made Spitz fear the California dog's rivalry for his lead position. And his fear increased as he recognized the new dog's growing strength and cunning. It's hard to chop. It's like trying to cut up a tree that's made of iron. Oh. Yeah, by the time you finish, we'll be nearly frozen to death. Hey, mon vieux, si le cœur tordit, la place est libre, hein? If you think you can do better, you just come out here and chop up the trunk. Hey. Ah, ah, oui, oui, mon vieux. I come, I chop the whole trunk, uh, the limbs, everything, huh? <laughs> 
take the Iron Man to chop the Iron Tree, huh? Something for Spitz. He had been a good dog. Get him! That spit is sleeping far out tonight. California kill him good. Maybe better off out there. We don't have to go no further. The thrill of battle and the kill had a sense of familiarity as of nothing new or strange. It marked the completeness of his transformation back through the ages to the ways of his wild fathers. Under the unwritten law of club and fang, the leadership of the team now belonged to the California dog. It was what he had patiently waited for, knowing one day it would be his. He eagerly took up the duties of leadership, and where strength and judgment were required, he quickly proved himself to be superior. Though the dogs had grown tired and discontent, he animated the entire team with a new solidarity and enthusiasm for their task. <laughs> hey, Mush! Hey, Mush! Hey, Mush! Oh, Mush! I told you, the weather was going to go bad on us. Look at the sky. We've got to move. We're moving. Let's not work him to death. If the weather gets bad enough, we can dig in and let it blow on by. I don't go this far to dig in. We'll be getting to the kind of digging we really like, Francois. Just give it a chance. Just how many chances do you think we've got? We've got every chance in the world. Okay. Uh. Come on, march! 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 Thank <laughs> you. 
In time, the dogs grew tired and terribly foot sore. No spring or rebound was left in them. Their feet fell heavily on the trail, jarring their bodies and doubling the fatigue of each day's travel. It was not the dead tiredness that comes through brief and excessive effort from which recovery is made in a matter of hours, but it was the dead tiredness that comes through the slow and prolonged strength drainage of months of toil. There was no power of recuperation left, no reserve strength to call upon. It had all been used, the last least bit of it. Every muscle, every fiber, every cell was tired. And there was good reason for it. In less than five months, they had traveled over 1,200 miles. Oh. Oh. He's trying. Oh my God, he's no. trying. He cannot do it. No longer can do. It was to die in the traces. We didn't have the time for that. Hey, Davy. Oh, Davy. Uh, come on. Come on. Never walk together. This what? The whole thing is a damn dream. You know? I dream dreams in colors. This Klondike dream is all in two colors. White and red. Snow and blood. This ain't no man's country. It's the devil's. Come. Devil's mighty big up here, isn't he? He's dead white and he doesn't care. <laughs> oh, but you got a snow blind. Huh, yeah. Oh, you come with us, we we'll take care of you. No, I still got ten miles west to go before dark. What are you going to the west and to the east and to the north and to the south? <laughs> we just passed the line cabin. We'll take you there and get your eyes back for you. Hey, my old Skagway friend, we don't let anything happen to you, huh? We get those eyes going again. Come on. All my eyes Come can on. go, hey? I don't need my eyes. When I get near the gold, I can smell it. <laughs> no matter where it is, if it's close by, I smell it. <laughs> Whoa!
Uh, we got just a thing for you, Simpson. Hi. You're lucky we come along, Jack, eh? I'm lucky to run into my old friend from Skagway. <laughs> come on. Let's sit down there. Ah. Hey. That takes the burn out of fraud bite. But I think it helps to clear the eyes too, eh? And I think it's all I've got. Hey, we drink to Skagway, eh? <laughs> and we drink to the strike that we're all gonna make. Hey, could be somewhere else. Ah, I don't want to go anywhere else. I never knew there was anything like this Klondike in the whole world. Oh. I feel like I was made for it. Come on, you've gone Klondike crazy. You know, Jack, got a crazy partner. Yeah. <laughs> but even no crazy partner, no crazy team. I wouldn't be here drinking whiskey in this place. <laughs> I am crazy. <laughs> the gold. It ain't crazy. And I'm going to get it. We're going to get it too. But we ain't going to get it walking circles in the snow. <laughs> Where? Well, there was a miner two or three years back. Eh? He'd been to a place named Two Cabin. A strike. Nobody believed the strike at Two Cabin. But moi, I believe. Yeah. He came back with two dogs. He started with 25, and he had to eat all the others. When he came back to Dawson, he could see nothing but Two Cabin. Two Cabin. It was crazy. Maybe the cold. Maybe the dog meat, I don't know, tried to stop the gangrene. We hauled him down, we cut off his fingers, we cut off his tools. His nose was frozen too, but uh, we could not. We could not. And all the time we cut, he said, two cabin. Two cabin. He died of the gangrene. Some of the others say that he stole the gold from miners near the Chilkoot and killed them. But I think he strike. Strike at Two Cabin. That's where we're going. We're not so far from Two Cabin now. If this dog's old out another week, we'll be there. I wish to God I could talk you out of it. I've been there. That's the worst place in the whole Klondike. You think there's gold up there? You're just playing crazy. You just picked up on somebody's wild idea. The way things have been, you're gonna be dead before the spring ever gets here. When a man comes up here, gotta take a chance. Me and Thornton, we feel lucky. We think that we know what a strike is. We all think we know. So I gotta get moving. My God, where am I? This feels like your home, Jack. You never left. Good God! I've been gone all day and I never left. 
I don't have 10 miles to make. I got 20. Where's my gear? Just outside. Hey, Jack. If you think you must go, better take this. Eskimo way bone. Wear this. You're snow blind no more. Yeah. 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 I said Bella Coola. And so did you. No, John. Two cabin is the good strike. You come with me. We're both be rich men. I got two partners heading up there. I promised I'd be there. I'm your partner, Thornton. We go to cabin. You're a fool, Thornton. You don't even know where Bella Coola is, eh? I get you as near Balakula as you ever get. You will never be able to get there without no sled, no supplies, no dog, without somebody that knows what he's doing, eh? You know, I like you, Thornton. You've knocked me down two times, but I still like you. You sold me out for a hundred bucks to buy that dog. No one made you come. You sold me out. Nobody in the Klondike ever says that about Francois Perrault. You sold me out! No. You make me do it, John. Take care of you, Thornton. But I must go. I leave you plenty of wood, half of the bacon, and most of all the beans. You stay close to the stove and you make it. I'll be back in three weeks. That's why you won't be back in three weeks or three years. Or 300 years. I'm the only one who knows the place. And when Francois comes back from two cabin, come back with the gold, not with the gangrene. One thing you left out. Where is Bella Coola? Oh, it's about 130 miles. I leave you my compass. The line of 272 leads you Bella Coola in two weeks. When your leg close up, you get there with no trouble. The only trouble I've had getting there, Francois, is you. So go on, mush on out of here.
Marsh! Marsh! Hey! Marsh! Marsh! Come on! Hey, Marsh! Come on! Marsh! Go! Marsh! Go! Come on, Marsh! Marsh! Hey, California! Mush! Come on! Mush! Allez! Hey. Debout! Allez! Hey. Oh, allez, hey, en avant! Oh! Oh, allez, hey, en avant! Oh! Allez, hey, debout! Allez, hey, debout, Feignant! Debout! Allez! Hey. Mush! Come on! Mush! Come on! Mush! Allez! Hey. Debout! Allez! Hey. Oh, allez, hey, en avant! Oh! Le froid! Touch the dog again and I'll kill you. He's more dead than alive. You want him? I leave him for you. Who knows, maybe you hit him before spring. Come on, Sam. Come on. You'll be my lead dog, eh? Hey? Stay. Hey. Stay. Uh, here we are. Come on now. Mush. Hey. Mush. Oh. Mush. 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 Hey. Mush. Oh. Mush. Busted you up. Oh, you buck. Yeah. Hey, buck. Uh. <laughs> hey, you sloppy headed old California dog, huh? And so the California dog became Buck, and for the first time received the kindness and affection that he had once known in distant days. With Thornton's love and care, he slowly recovered his strength and sense of animal dignity. Though the cruelty he had known from man was soon forgotten, the primitive instincts which his fight for survival had aroused were never far from him, and the sounds of the night stirred him to remembrance of old pain. It was the song of the fear and mystery of the cold and dark, the song of the unnumbered generations of his breed. Thank you. 
can get to where I want to go, Buck, I know that stuff is there. We got the weather. At least ways we got it right now. Yeah. We're going to Bella Coola. <laughs> Bella Coola. Huh? Nothing there, Buck. Not to that great good place yet either. Got a little ways to go. We got good weather. Yeah. I do think we're gonna get there. summertime.
was about ready to give up on you and keep this old place for myself. Yeah, well, I reckon it wouldn't have hurt if Bella could have been on the map. Didn't give me any trouble. <laughs> I'm picking, <laughs> John. <laughs> Look. Uh, that came out of this creek in one month's work of one man. Now there are three of us. <laughs> God only knows how much more there is. Stuff seems to be all through here. Now you're here, I can get to Dawson and file a claim. While you're gone, I'll, I'll stow you and me here. Keep working that sluice. Yeah, maybe we can make this place a little more livable, because it looks like we're going to be here a while. <laughs> it shouldn't take me more than about two weeks, and when I get back, our grandchildren aren't going to be wanting for anything. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what it is. The piano broke down here about two weeks ago, and well, I got the only guitar in Dawson, and I come in here and play. Are you sure playing good? Oh, it ain't all that good, but well, if they want music, they gotta have me. It's the early morning loving that makes everything all right. It's what happens in that little room before the break of light. It's what happens in that little room before I walk out the door. It's the early morning loving that's what I'm living for. I bet you know what I'm talking about. Do I ever? How about this? <laughs> uh, wait, uh, Rose... Rose? Rose Jane. Well, ain't you something? <laughs> Everybody's something up here, Rose! Oh, huh. <laughs> <laughs> I've been working in a body house sometimes, I don't know why. I can't make no money, no matter how hard I try. But what happens with 
my real man Before that morning light Is that early morning loving That makes everything all right Well, it'll come up just about any time you want it to. Of course, you have that big old dog to keep you warm. You don't need me. Oh, yes, I do. I'm awful glad to see you, Rosemary. I really am. How is it? It's good. Everything up here is selling high. Eggs, good liquor, bath, clean bed, me. Care of yourself. Well now, Daddy. You got and pick yourself a dog that likes to fight. That Billy boy here. He's not so keen on the scrapping. <laughs> Are yeah, you, boy? But he's strong as hell. Aren't you, Billy? Huh? Here you are, boy. <laughs> you know, he can pull 750 pounds. A buck can pull a thousand pounds. Hey, you say. All the dogs up here, there's none can do that. You're talking about half a ton, man. The good Lord, he never made a dog so strong. You know, a dog can do just so much. But any more that they can't do. And nobody should ever ask him to try. A buck can do it. <laughs> you, you think your dog could, could break a thousand pound sled loose from the ice? <laughs> And walk away with it, maybe for, say, uh, uh, 50 yards or so? Huh? I do. Hey, 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 Buck. Hey. You think you can break out a thousand pounds and pull it away? Huh? Buck. Buck. I got two thousand dollars, says he can't. You must be a crazy man. And you must have a crazy dog. I don't want to take your money. You can take it if you can get it. I got my sled. Right now. Right outside. And it's loaded with 20, 50 pound bags of flour. I don't want to take no advantage of, of any man. No, 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 no dog. All right, you're on. I think you you'll be sorry you ever told me sorry. Come on, my lovely. Come on. Come on, boys. Make way out here. Hey, coming through. <laughs> Hey, Mike, what is it? 
in so tight. there and turn the dog loose. Marsh, Buck! Marsh, come on, Buck! Marsh! Oh, Buck! Marsh! Oh, <laughs> 
for the dog. Well, is there anything wrong? I... You can go to hell, sir. I'm trying to catch you a big fish now. Hey, where are you going, Buck? It's the kind of work I really don't mind. Despite the love Buck had for John Thornton, the claims of mankind slip farther and farther from him with each passing day. In a mysterious way, he was lured by the sounds and scents of the forest, compelling him to plunge into the wild, where it seemed he used to run before in a dimly remembered world of shadowed forest beneath a wide sky. You know, I figure if we can work pretty steady for the next three months, we ought to be able to take about three or four hundred thousand out of here. Pretty good take, John. He sat by the fire, a long furred dog. But behind him were the generations of all manner of dogs, half wolves and wild wolves of the pack, singing the night song of their breed the sad song of the woe and pain of his wild fathers. Their nocturnal call seemed to arouse in him an awareness that he was a thing of the wild, come in from the wild, who had but briefly warmed himself at mankind's fireside, and the call that sounded in the forest compelled him to turn his back upon the comfort of the campfire. <laughs> It was a dog, or something like a dog. But there was something about the eyes that Buck had never seen before. They were slanted and uptilted, and Buck knew at once when he saw the eyes that the creature had never sat beside a fire or pulled a sled or ever felt the hand of a human being. Where you been, you big brute? 
Hey, let the big one alone. He's got his own ideas. Let's get back to this millionaire business, huh? Right. was haunted by the recollections of his wild brother and the mysteries of the wilderness where he would wander for days at a time unaided alone existing by virtue of his own strength and cunning surviving in a hostile environment where only the strong survived Thank you.